Hi, my name's Dave Micah. How I got started. Very interesting story. So I grew up in upstate New York in the Catskill Mountains, uh, 35 kids in my graduating class. Graduated in 1979, went to the State University of New York at Fredonia for my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. Graduated in 1983 in May. So as soon as I got done graduating, I was a business and economics major. I was looking for a job, and I spent about six months looking for a job the traditional ways. And finally, my mom called my aunt, who said, um, your nephew needs a job. So she worked for the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland, and my uncle also worked there, and he was a very senior executive. In fact, he was a person who was responsible for giving the RCA plant here in Camden a lot of work. So he said... Um, geez, let me see what I can do. So he called me about a week later and said, would you like to come down and work for the National Security Agency in Maryland? And I said, absolutely, that sounds great. And he said, it'll take about 18 months for you to get a security clearance and we can probably hire you sometime in late 85. And I said, well, I kind of need a job now. So he said, hang on. So he hung up and about a day later he called back and he said, I've arranged for you to travel to South Jersey. And I had never been south of northern New Jersey. He said, there's a plant there called the RCA plant. I want you to go down there. They're going to call you for an interview. You should go down and interview. So that was at the end of April in 1984. So I, um, they called me, set up an interview. I drove to South Jersey here. Never, Like I said, never been south of North Jersey. Came down Admiral Wilson Boulevard, came into Camden, and I wasn't quite sure what kind of place he sent me for an interview. So I uh, parked my car. I walked into Building 2 on the corner of Front and Cooper Street, and I went up to the personnel department and they set me up uh, for interviews. And I found it the strangest thing because I was 23 years old, entry level position, and I looked at the interview slate and they had me interviewing with three vice presidents and two directors, which I thought was very strange for, you know, kind of an entry level position. So I went through a series of interviews, and uh, they were all pretty short, and I was a little nervous, obviously, being 23. These people had all been here for 30 years, and um, I think it was about a week later, I got an email, that, or uh, I'm sorry, a letter that said, congratulations, you've been hired at RCA in Camden. Uh, your start date is May 8th, 1984. Your starting salary is $18,000 a year. And you have been selected to be in the RCA, very exclusive, uh, training program. So I sent back a uh, letter, said thank you very much, and I came down here and reported to work that first day. Mm -hmm. Now, I, since I had never been down here, I didn't know where to live. I got lost about 10 times going across the Ben Franklin Bridge. I didn't know if I was in Philadelphia or New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I finally found an apartment in uh, Voorhees. But I started May 8th, 1984 in the RCA training program. So when I came in the first day, it was pretty interesting. They said, you're going to be in this very exclusive program. Only the best and brightest get put in this program. And what's going to happen is you're going to work six weeks in every organization here at RCA in Camden. You're going to work six weeks in engineering, six weeks in the program office, six weeks in manufacturing, six weeks in business development, six weeks in quality, contracts, the pricing organization. You're going to do that for a year. And at the end of the year, we'll figure out where the best fit for you is. So that was great for me because I learned the entire business and I worked for some people that were unbelievable because I was pretty young and I couldn't believe really how smart the people were here and how little I actually knew. And uh, every six weeks I rotated, every week I had to actually write a weekly report to the chief financial officer here. His name was Ed Williams. And I thought that was kind of strange that a trainee would actually, you know, send a report to the CFO. But I got to meet some fabulous people. I met Art Llewellyn in the program office. I met Joe Christopher and Vic Scarpello in manufacturing. Met Bob Roadside, Ed Williams in um, the finance organization. Met Don Parker. Met Jack Serafin, who were in the executive management team here. I just met a, a lot of great people. Phil Gaiman from the contracts organization. And that went on for about a year. So at the end of the year, they called me in, and I was waiting for them to tell me where I would go work. And they said to me, oh, where would you like to go work? You can work in any department you want. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the strangest thing. This industry is great. They let you go anywhere you want, pick anywhere you want. 
And I couldn't really figure it out being 23 years old. So I decided, I really had my career well thought out, you could tell. I decided I wanted to go work in the pricing department. Mm -hmm. And why did I pick pricing? I picked pricing because at the time, there was a number of senior people in that department that were ready to retire. Mm -hmm. And they had just hired about six guys that were my age. And I said, oh, this will be fun. They're my age. We can go out and play softball and hang out together. It had nothing to do with my career. I just thought that organization had people my age, so that's why I joined the pricing department. And what I didn't realize until several years later is the only reason I interviewed with three vice presidents and two directors is of because who my uncle was. And the only reason I got to pick what organization I wanted to work in is because of who my uncle was. And it it, sh it really went to show me a lot that it's, it's sometimes it's about who you know and how influential they are mm -hmm. versus what your skills were. But it was a great experience for me. It was the, probably one of the top three things that happened to me in my 31 years here because I got to meet so many people and see all the aspects of the company. It was really very beneficial. So that's how I got started. <laughs> Once you got finished, um enjoying sort of figuring out your personal ways that you connected with RCA. What, what ended up making you feel energized in doing work at RCA? So um, what I quickly realized being down here is that RCA was an institution. I knew a little bit about RCA. You know, everybody's grandparents either had a Victrola or a TV set. But as I started to live down here for the first couple of years, I realized how many people worked here, how many people's parents worked here and grandparents worked here. And the people here were so prideful of the things that have been accomplished here, all the inventions and the innovation. And as you, that, that starts to get into your fabric here. It's more than just a job. This was really a family. Things like, you know, they would call the family, it was called the family store here, the RCA family store. And people really like a family here. And everybody treated me great. And I, and I have to say to this day, 31 years later, when new people come into this facility to work, and it doesn't matter the name of the company, I think it's the location we're at here, people make you feel, feel very welcome. And they did that to me. And uh, there was a lot of social functions, retirement parties, company events, where it really was just a family atmosphere. And everybody had the same mission. Everybody knew the work we were doing was critically important for the country. So um, I just thought it was a great place to work because they made you feel like a family. And that's what I really liked about it. Did you have any work mentors, people who led you? Oh, yeah, career? absolutely. So uh, early in your, careers, uh, uh, in your career, you have a lot of mentors. And... Uh, what I learned is what you want to do is take all your mentors and take the good traits from from all of them and some of the traits that you may learn, you know, you didn't like so much, you try to shed those. But yeah, I had a lot of great mentors early on. Um, I had uh, Phil Gaiman in the contracts organization, really helped me significantly. Um, Bob Roadside was my first real boss in the pricing organization. Bob was a very intense guy. His expectation is that you worked about 70 hours a week. Um, so that kind of instilled in me the mindset. Um, I worked for Paul Morocco, who was a program manager here and was incredibly smart and showed me a lot of interesting things. Um, as I started to get into my career a little bit more, I worked for Jim Hemscott, who uh, was a program manager at the time, then worked, him, worked himself up to a very senior staff level position here. I uh, I worked for uh, Fred Blakelock, who was in the finance organization. Just a lot of great people that really helped me. And um, they treated me as a person that they wanted to help grow. So they showed me a lot. There was never any, we're not going to tell you, we're not going to show you, we're trying to protect our job. A lot of people really tried to help me grow in the organization. So yeah, those are some of my early mentors. Do you have a story that can demonstrate how they would try to help you grow as a person? Oh, sure. So... Um, it was really interesting. One of my first business trips was up to Fort Monmouth, Seacom. And um, we went up there on a trip. And the gentleman, uh, Ed Probes and Harvey Weisskettle were the two people. And Harvey was a senior contracts administrator. And Ed Probes worked in the pricing department. And they only took me on the trip. They didn't need me, but they wanted to expose me to my first business trip where I'd be in front of a customer. Mm -hmm. So they said, we're going to take you. You don't have to do anything on this trip, but listen and learn and watch how it, you know, how these things go. So we went up to Fort Monmouth in uh, northern New Jersey with the Army customer, and it was those two. And it was about three people on the Army side, a colonel and a couple of his assistants. And my role was only to sit there and just observe. Well, 
my nature is not really to sit there and just observe. And I had only been here for like four months. So about 20 minutes in the meeting, I started um, interjecting my thoughts. And and I could tell the other two guys were okay with it. They let me uh, do a few things that they probably wouldn't because I was asking some questions and how we could help the customer. And that kind of showed me that if you can add value to a meeting or add value to the whole business operation, people will let you uh, participate. And uh, I was really thankful because on the way home, they said, listen, We didn't expect you to do anything but sit there and learn, but anytime you take a proactive role to try to help the business and move the business ahead and conduct yourself professionally, that's a good thing. And that was like my first experience with a customer, and those guys let me kind of go out on my own and really help them. And that was was a great experience. Can you tell us about one or two of your major projects you worked on while here at RCA? Oh, sure. So... So from 1984 probably to uh, 1992, what I really wanted to be after I worked in finance for five years, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a program manager here because I thought being a program manager was absolutely the best job in the plant. You were responsible for everything on the program. You got to work with every single organization. You got to lead a group of people. You got to deal with customers. Um, sometimes it was a tough, tough job because you were responsible for everything and sometimes in control of nothing. But I, it was my whole, you know, from the time I was 24 years old, that's what I wanted to be a program manager here. Mm-hmm. And well, one of my first jobs, uh, one of my first significant jobs is they just don't let you be a program manager here. And they certainly never let you be a program manager unless you have an engineering degree. And for the first eight years of my career, people would say, you know, you really can't be a program manager. You, you're not, you don't have an engineering degree. But I, I was convinced I could do it. So eventually, a gentleman by the name of Paul Morocco, who was a program manager here, said, I'm going to make you a program manager. But we're not going to make you a program manager. We're going we're gonna to make you a deputy program manager. You're kind of the helper to the program manager. And then he said, well, in fact, we're not really going to make you the deputy. We're going to make you the deputy to the deputy <laughs> program manager. So they let me work on a program called the High Rate Tape Recorder, which is a program for NASA. It was a tape recorder program that went into space. And I was responsible for some of the major subcontractors who were working for us. And they gave me a technical person to assist me. And that's how I really got into the program office. And that was a wonderful job because I learned the difference between building equipment for the military for an airborne or ground application and building stuff for the space environment. And when you build stuff for space, it's very high reliability. There's a lot of documentation. It's a whole different thing. And that gave me the opportunity to really learn what this business was all about. So I kind of graduated from deputy program manager. And then eventually, they made me the full-fledged deputy program manager on that job. And then what happened a couple of years later, we got another job and these guy job got in a little bit of trouble because they were very difficult. So we had some cost pressures and technical issues. So they had to split these jobs up and put a manager in charge of each one. And at the time, I was working with Jim Hemscott, who was in charge of our space station program, I think. I think he was in charge of space station. And they came to me um, and said, you know, we're going to give you this Landsat program to be the program manager of the Landsat 7 solid state recorder program that went on the Landsat 7 satellite. So I said, wow, I'm going to actually be in charge of this thing. So they put me in charge of it. And that was in the mid to late 90s. And it was a great experience because I got to deal directly with the customer. I had about 40 people working for me in engineering and manufacturing. And um, it was my real first shot at being a, a program manager. No safety net. I had to report directly to the staff level person, and it, it was a great opportunity. That was the first big thing that happened to me in my career in terms of management. Mm-hmm. Now, the second big thing that happened to me is at the end of that uh, time period, 1997, when I finished up that program, I was uh, working for Jim Hemscott on the space station program. Jim was the program manager at the time. And we had a large subcontract with a company called Motorola in Scottsdale, Arizona. So uh, Jim and the president of this division, Greg Roberts, called me over to the office and said, hey, we need you to go out to Scottsdale, Arizona for about a week or two weeks and help manage this subcontractor. They're having a lot of problems. We need another person out there from L3 in Camden. At that time, we had just become L3, 1997. So I packed up, told my wife, I had a young daughter, uh, my son was about five, my daughter was just born, and uh, I said, okay, I'll go out to Arizona for a week or 10 days to help get them straightened out. 
So I got on a plane. I went out to Arizona. And what they said is, um, we'll go with you. So Greg Roberts and Jim Hemscott took me out to meet the Motorola management. They wanted to say, Dave Mike is going to be here on site at your plant to help you. Now, remember, they were working for us. We were the customer. So I'll never forget it. We walked in to meet the uh, president of the site out there at Motorola. And I'm standing there, and it's Greg Roberts, Jim Hemscott, and myself. And they introduced me to the president of the Motorola division. And they said, Dave's going to be here to help manage you. And they said, we don't want him here. And I said, do they realize I'm standing right here? They told me they didn't want me here. So I said, okay, this is not going to be really a great relationship. But what it did is it got me um, out away from the plant, got me to learn how to work with a subcontractor and manage myself away from this place. Now, ironically, it was supposed to be a seven to 10 day assignment. It ended up being a seven month assignment. I was there from the middle of July in 97 till Christmas Eve, 1997. And it was really tough on my family and, and my children growing up. But it was a great experience. I've worked really hard. But being still pretty new to that kind of game traveling business, I didn't really work out all the logistical details with the company. So, for example, uh, they said you'd be here for two weeks. So I went it went and uh, stayed at the Camelback Inn in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it was July. Hot. Nobody goes to Arizona. It was really incredibly cheap. The room was only $99 a night, a beautiful resort. Now, since I thought I was only going to be there two weeks, I didn't get any long-term agreement with the resort. I didn't get any long-term car rental agreement. I just stayed there for two weeks. Now, you're supposed to put your expense reports in every week to the company. Well, I kind of forgot to do that. And um, what happened is I was there in July, I was there in August, and I was there in September. What I didn't realize, being kind of naive, is... September 1st, the rates changed because now people want to go to Arizona. So the rate went from $99 a night to $349 a night. Well, I didn't know. And I was just staying there for seven months. And I was supposed to put my expense report in um, every week. Well, when I came back Christmas, December 24th and 97, I said, hey, I better add up all my expenses. So I added up all my expenses and I went to see Jim and I said, Jim, uh, I guess I should have put my expense reports in before this because my total expenses for living out there is like $42,000. And um, it didn't get me fired. It was probably the only time that I came close to getting fired. They <laughs> called me over and it, Jim basically saved me. He went in to see the president and said, uh, you know, the young kid, he made a mistake. But uh, I was living pretty good. Alaskan king crab legs every night, macadamia nuts. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, what it really took to do a long-term stay. But uh, that was really um, a big change and uh, got in a little bit of trouble. But we recovered from that. And then probably the next biggest thing or maybe the most important thing that ever happened to me here in my 31 years. Uh, when I came back from that assignment, December 97, L3 had just formed as a company. The CEO, Frank Lanza, was looking to get into some new markets, and he thought we had the ability here in Camden to get into the airborne market to provide something called a solid-state data recorder for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. These were basically, think of it as a fancy VCR that would go on an airplane that would record images from a camera. Well, most people had putting tape recorders on airplanes for 30 years. Frank's vision was to put solid state equipment on there, so no moving parts, basically flash memory. So I said, geez, that'll be really cool. Can I be in charge of that? And they said, no, you can't be in charge. What do you know about airplanes and that? Well, the problem was the CEO wanted us to do this, and nobody really was available to do it. So I put my hand up and said I would do it. So they put me in charge of this new project, and I got some independent research and development funding from the company, and I was told to put together a team of engineers and business development people and try to go make this something. Well, we did. It, it took a lot of work. We made it into something called the Star Product Line, and I was kind of the product manager for that. We had a great engineering team led by John Waring, Steve Montgomery, a number of fantastic engineers, hired some business development people. And I was responsible for not only kind of in inventing the product, not technically, but, you know, the vision of it. I did all the business development, the marketing, the branding. I met all the customers and I got to travel all around the world to try to sell this product. And the best thing it did for me that helped my career, it got me to meet all the people at L3 Corporate because this was really the CEO's project. So I got to meet the corporate vice president of business development, the corporate vice president of engineering, of strategy, all the people in the L3 corporate Washington office. 
And um, by doing that, I just got great exposure through the company. And the first couple of years were tough. We didn't sell anything. And we spent millions of dollars of the company's money developing this product. And when I couldn't sell the black one that was one foot by one foot, I decided, hey, we need an orange one that's a little bit shorter. So they gave me more money to build the orange one. Well, I couldn't sell any of those either. So then I said, I need a longer one that's a different color. So they kept funding millions and millions of dollars into this for the first three or four years. And I produced no business. So I was getting a little nervous. So finally, we got our big break. We won a job in 2001 called the SHARP program. It was the shared reconnaissance pod for the F-18. It was a huge program. And by winning that program, it really launched the product line because as soon as we won that, uh, we won the F-16 program. We won a program in Sweden, a program in Denmark, a program in South Korea. It just started to take off and we went from no business to 10, 12, 15 million dollars of business a year. And then in 2004, we won a huge program called the P8A program, where we put a whole suite of recorders on that aircraft. And we got that business up to about 30 million dollars a year. And that single thing that I worked on from probably 1997 to really about 2005, that was probably the single biggest thing that actually propelled my career because I got such visibility, great team of people you know, engineering, marketing, manufacturing, quality, finance. We just had a great team of people. And it was one of the most well-known things in L3. And it's because it was one of the CEO's pet projects, Mr. Lanza. And that is what really helped propel my career into some of this more senior level management positions. Great. So um, you talked about having a great team of people you mm -hmm. worked with. Um, I've heard that from a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. And so um, why do you think, can you tell me a little bit about the people you worked with here at Sure. And, um, RCA L3 and GE, and what made them so such a strong group of employees? Yeah, so it's pretty it's pretty cool. When you come in here as a 23-year-old, um, when you sit in the room with these people, you realize just how smart they are. They're not the smartest people in the building. They're not the smartest people in South Jersey. They're some of the smartest people in the country doing work for the national defense. And... Um, I was working in the classified business area, and I got the opportunity to work with people like Maurice Timken and and um, and Conrad Haber, and just really brilliant people. I worked with John Waring. I worked with Mike Riddle. I worked with just really smart people. And uh, as I started to form my own teams as a manager here, I had people like Gene Kasai and Tom Kasney and uh, Bruce Baconis and Steve Horvath and Tung Nan. And, they're just all brilliant, brilliant engineers, software, hardware, mechanical systems, and uh, it's just incredible how smart they are. And sometimes you feel really, you know, you're really in the presence of brilliant people. But um, what made them great is not only their technical ability, most of them were terrific with customers. They listen, they understand what the customer's needs were. But the thing that I think always separates the people here is, um, I asked somebody a few years back, I said, how, how are we different than every other defense contractor? Because other defense contractors have smart people and they have passionate people and they care about the national security work we do. But the one thing that people always said here, and it's true and it's still true today, is when we take a project from the government and we work on it, there's always issues because we're doing really hard things here. And there's schedule pressures and there's cost pressures and there's technical innovation, things that we're trying to do. We're trying to invent things here that have never done before. But when it's all said and done, the thing that always is true on every job I've ever worked on, the people here will always get the customer to the end, meaning whatever it may be take a little longer than we said, and it may cost a little more than we anticipated. But at the end, we will get them there. We will get them the thing they want. And um, that's what really is impressive about the people here. There's no give up. There's no, we can't do it. We'll always get there and provide a solution for their needs. It's just really incredible. That's the number one thing that I think through the 30-some years here I've seen in everybody. Whatever it takes, we'll get them there. So can you tell us about the transitions from RCA to GE and L3? Sure. And the, experience? Yeah, so that, like? that was very traumatic. Uh, so when I started, I was an RCA guy, right? I, yeah. 1984, and the whole place was RCA, and I was here a couple of years, and like I said, I met a lot of great people, understood the family tradition. Then, of course, in 1986, Jack Wells from GE decided he wanted to buy RCA, and he primarily did that because he wanted to own NBC. 
So only being two years in the business, you know, when that notice came out in 1986, it was a big shock because I didn't even know what it meant. But um, after about a week, things settled down and it was really great. I was sitting in my office one day figuring, okay, same thing. Everything's the same. We got a new name change and I didn't have business cards at the time, so I didn't have to worry about that. But um, they came in my office one day and said, great, let me tell you how GE works and how we're different from RCA. Um, you don't get to stay at the facility you're working at. The GE theory is we're going to move you around the country so you get broader experiences. And I was just married and kids, and I, I didn't want to move anywhere. And I just made friends here, and I just kind of settled in South Jersey. And they said, I'll tell you what, we'll give you two days to tell us where you want to move. There's some openings in Utah. There's some up in Massachusetts. Where would you like to go work? And I didn't want to go anywhere. So I went home, and I was really worried about this. I was talking to my wife, and um, I didn't know what to do. Well, I came back in the next day, and they came down to see me. It was actually the CFO. His name was Mark Meachies. Mark said, good news. You're going to move, but we're only going to let we're only going to make you move over to Philadelphia. You're going to move over to Chestnut Street, where we have a GE operation over there, reentry systems, and that um, that was about uh, 1997 or 1998. And I didn't want to move, but since it was closed, I decided I'd do it. Now, in fact, it's not much farther from my house to here than it is over Sandy, Center City, Philadelphia. But it was a completely different state. I had to go over a bridge, pay city wage tax, didn't have a place to park. But I went over there and in the late 90s, and I stayed for three years. And, and again, it was one of the best things that happened to me because ultimately when that business closed after the Cold War, many of those people came over here to work in Camden. And it was a great experience because I got to meet Greg Roberts and Bob Talley and Bob Neff, John Tierney, uh, Mike Blanco, just a lot of people that worked over there that came over here. And I got to see a completely different business. So that was a different experience. GE had a different mindset. Uh, they were a lot about making money. We had to make sure we made money on everything we did. Um, but then I came back here, and then, of course, GE sold the operation to Martin Marietta. So we got went back to a more traditional defense contractor, somebody who was just focused on defense. And then the merger happened between Martin Marietta and Lockheed to form Lockheed Martin. And that was okay, but now we were a big, big defense contractor. And what I kind of didn't like about that is... We were just a small fish in the big Lockheed Martin machine, and um, we didn't get the visibility or the acknowledgement or the investment that I think we deserved, and that was kind of a problem. But when Frank Lanza and Bob LaPenta formed L3 Communications, all that changed, and uh, this has been a great company to work for because it was founded on flexibility and innovation and people, and it's been that way for the last 18 years. And, uh, you know, so I like to say I worked for five different companies. I've never, you know, never left the company, worked for RCA, GE, Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, and then L3. And the people at the beginning, RCA, and the people now, L3, the bookends are what's really made it special because it's just the same kind of mindset in both of those, and I've really enjoyed it. You talked about the RCA family, and you mm -hmm. kind of alluded that L3 feels very much like the mm -hmm. RCA family. Mm -hmm. What what do you think attributes to that c continuation? Is it the fact that there are a lot of employees that still work there, or is it that Frank Lanza um, was important to that? Or I, I think it's both. So, you know, I've been here 31 years, but there's many people that, you know, when I go into a meeting, I have skip-level meetings with employees, right, um, not on my staff. Some of them have been here for three weeks. Some of them have been here for 35 years. And so I've grown up with a lot of these people. When I became president, I actually became president 28 days to the year. So I, be, I started here May 8th, 1984. I became president May 8th, 2012. But I can tell you, some of the people I started with when I was just very young and inexperienced are the same people that work here now, and I'm kind of leading the organization. So um, you just kind of grow up with these people, and you know now they want to call me sir and so forth, and you know that was a hard adjustment for me, quite frankly, because we all grew up th together through the ranks, and there's just a lot of great people here. So I think it's the time and the heritage of the long... Um, tenure of many people here. The current tenure of our employees is 17 years. Um, so people come here and they don't leave. And I think Frank Lanz's uh, inspirational spirit, innovation, entrepreneurial uh, mindset just kept things going here. And he was very proud of this division. We have done a lot of great things here. Uh, we've contributed to a lot of national security issues. But he always was about 
engineering. The thing I always say about um, this operation is, and now as the president, it's easy to look at. I have an engineering organization, a manufacturing, quality, finance, program offices. We have HR, IT, but this is an engineering company. The only reason we get any business is because of engineering. Everybody else is here to support engineering. We're not an insurance company. We're not an accounting firm. We're an engineering company. So people give us business because of the engineers we have here. And it's all about how engineering does. And the rest of us, quite frankly, are here to support engineering. All very important critical cogs in the machine, but without engineering, there is no business here. So um, Frank Lanza, that was his mindset. He was a true engineer's engineer. I remember the first time I met him, he was the CEO. And um, I had brief admirals and generals and executives of other company. But when you go to in front of the CEO for the first time, it's a little nerve wracking. So I had prepared for my first briefing with him for about two months. And um, I remember the second question he asked me is what kind of connectors we were using on the system we were building. And I thought that was a very, very, very detailed question for the CEO to be asking. I thought he was going to say, how much money could we make or how, how much could we sell? Um, he asked me about the focal length of the camera. He asked me about what kind of hardware interfaces. So he was incredibly technical. And I think the people here really respected that because it is an engineering company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. I think the engineering thing, RCA, I think engineers loved working for RCA, right. so I can see that. Sure, people want to invent. When they yes. come here, they want to invent things. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, so uh, what was the best thing about working for RCA? I think the best thing about working it for me was that I was really young, and they let me experience so many different things. I didn't know the difference between HF and UHF and VHF. I didn't know the difference between an Ohio class submarine and a Los Angeles class submarine. I didn't know that when you put equipment in space, the quality of the parts had to be a much higher quality than the quality of parts you put on the ground. I didn't understand that things you do had to be completely documented. And what RCA allowed me to do was experience so many different people, um, technologies, customer areas here that you grow up really quickly. Um, you just learn a lot. I think other companies kind of shuttle you through the program. They make you take years to learn different parts of the business. Within two years here, I felt like I knew a lot about this business, and uh, RCA gave you the opportunity to do that. Um, they provided training. I went to a lot of training programs early in my career. Um, they let you work as much as you want as long as you were contributing to the end product. So yeah, I think that was the best thing about RCA. For me personally, I got just such great experience, you know, such vast experience. Now this is the hardest question for everybody. What's the worst thing for work, uh, about working here? What's the worst thing about working here? Wow. <laughs> so the worst thing about working here, well, I love coming to work. I have for 31 years. I get up every morning. I, I love coming here. As the president, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Because every job I had, I kind of knew what the job was every day. As the president, it's a completely different job because I deal with um, employee issues, city of Camden issues, corporate issues, real estate issues, uh, facilities issues. It's not the things that you did for the first 28 years of career. I think the hardest thing about working here to me is making sure that the job and the career here is fulfilling for everybody because at the end of the day, life is short. You want to make sure you have a very fulfilling professional career, but I feel responsible for all the people that work here to some degree. I want to make sure we're doing the job. Uh, we have three people that I have to take care of every day. I have to take care of our customers, I have to take care of our employees, and I have to take care of our shareholders. And very important to me is that the employees that work here feel like this is a great place to work. So hard, probably hard is not the, the right thing. It's I want to make sure people feel like they're contributing and this is a great place to work. And when I sense people are a little down or they're frustrated, that's, you know, that, that's hard because I don't want them to feel that way because um, it's just a great place to work. And I want them to feel like I'm providing a great environment for them to work in. So... Um, how, how did South Jersey change in your time here and what influence do you think this company had on that 
change. So it's really interesting. My wife's father worked here. I didn't know that until I even met him. Uh, he worked here in the 60s. Uh, when I moved down here, um, since I, I didn't know anything about the area, I kind of settled in the Gloucester Township area. And what's changed about RCA in terms of time and what I've learned is, so no matter where you go, you see an RCA, you know, people have RCA records, people have Victrolas, people have radios, people have incredible things from RCA. And as the president now, people will call me all the time and say, would you like to collect this? Would you like to get this? You know, I'm moving out of my house. But I think RCA, the heritage here, it's embodied in the culture of South Jersey. I mean, there are people, Joe Pani will tell me that uh, RCA invented the middle class here in, in <laughs> South Jersey. Um, we, there's, there's so many people who have had great careers because of what RCA provided people. Um, you know, when I first started, I didn't know RCA for anything but their commercial work, television sets, radios. I didn't realize the important things they were doing in the uh, defense industry, the Minuteman missile program early on, BMUs, right, the Trident submarine. I didn't realize they were doing all those things. And it's such a diverse, great business that um, no matter who you see in South Jersey, somehow they either worked here, their uncle worked here, their children worked here, and that, that's really pretty cool. And, and they say, what do you do there? And I generally tell people I just work you know, at the old RCA plant in Camden. I really don't say what I do, but they always want to talk about, did you know this person or did you work on that program? It, it's really pretty cool. That's great. Um, so uh, how would you sum up your experience at RCA and... LG, L3. Well, here's how I would sum it up. I've only had one job. Yeah. Got out of college. This is the only place I've ever worked. Like everybody else, I've had plenty of opportunities to leave and look at other jobs. I've never left. I've never left. And it's because um, I just think this is a great place to work. It's a great company. I think RCA started it all, gave me the foundation. I'm very proud of the RCA heritage I have. I'm extremely proud to work for L3. And uh, I just love the work here. Um, Every day I get up, I'm really excited to come here. It's really great to be the president. They tell me I'm the first homegrown president here in almost three decades. Um, I work from really great people here. Some of the previous presidents here, um, I learned a lot from Greg Roberts specifically. He was one of my mentors and uh, just learned so much from him and how to lead an organization and lead people. And uh, I would never put myself in his um, category or class of leaders, but I've tried to learn from a lot of different people, and this place is great. Um, I, I plan to end my career here. I just, you know, very proud of what I've done, but I'm more proud of the people here and the people I know and the people I work with. It's just a wonderful place to work. Great. Anything else you want to share? Um, no, I think I think I would just tell people as you look back over your career, over the time in South Jersey. Think about all the things RCA has done, both commercially, but from my perspective, all the things RCA has done to protect this country, um, whether it's radar systems, systems in space. Um, when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the communication systems he used, um, whether it's forward deployed systems or classified systems, we've just done great things here. I tell my kids, I said, you know, I can't really talk about the work I do here, but I can tell you this. There are people around the country that sleep and should sleep easy at night because of the things we do in support of the national defense of this country. So there's a lot of pride in that, and uh, people feel very, very prideful of the work they do here. So that's the thing I like every day.